Hello, welcome to Thoughts on Future Online Manipulation. Um, a little bit of my thoughts on what I think about this particular subject. Uh, before I start, um, these are of course my own thoughts. You can disagree, that's perfectly fine, that's the internet, this is perfectly fine to do so. Um, happy to hear some replies and you know debate about this particular subject. There's a lot of theory in here, so if you're looking for reverse engineering or something like that, it's not going to be that. There's a lot of ideas that I think in 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 my mind what I think is going to happen in the future and just something that I think about sometimes and I thought I'd put into a presentation and talk about. Um, quite often I feel like people in information security often do these sort of presentations in commercial or places of uh, conventions and conferences that are left and the information isn't openly available um, at, or is online but is then never really looked at because they're just pushing for certain information but that's that's just my personal opinion um, of course this isn't related to my employer at all this is just my own thoughts so don't don't be trying to link anything this is just what I'm thinking of right now um, so in 2017, before I went to work, uh, I had um, some time to think over the summer and came up with this B-Sides uh, talk, which is uh, rolling circles on social media, intelligent open source intelligence. And the main point of the uh, talk, which happened in 2017, was um, basically how you could add circles of connections between people to understand them and their behavior. So looking at Dunbar circles, for instance, that someone really can only in real life have connections of a certain number. And is that true in a digital form? And if so, can you create those circles in some way? And I still think I hold up that that feeling and looking at that research, I thought was really interesting historically to just sort of take a little moment and look at that. And I sort of have an opinion with visualizations nowadays that sometimes they can look cooler than they actually do. And in some some ways that that presentation definitely brought, you know, the visualizations, what did it, what information did it actually glean? But I think some of the talking points I gave and sort of the connections towards open source intelligence is certainly something that I thought was definitely more substantial than I actually thought. Um, so if you hadn't seen that talk, please do have a look and see if you're interested in that. But this was just after some university research I'd done and then I, I went into work. So I hadn't properly looked back into this sort of area. Of course, it sort of goes into my area of work as I do threat intelligence, but it's not particularly completely there. There's more interest on reverse engineering for me rather than open source intelligence. But of course, that's they're, they're both building up in the same similar area, so maybe I should. But with that, uh, since then, there's been a, a number of different things that have definitely been an interesting addition to that research. And I'm not saying that this research is completely new and what was like world changing. It's something that I did. So in my head, I'm looking at it and then looking at other research. There was certainly research, and I think I talked about it during that presentation, that there was more research about semantic analysis, about open source intelligence. And actually, there were people already doing stuff like this, which we later found out, which Cambridge Analytica. So, you know, it's it's one of those things, the first bullet point there being Cambridge Analytica, we found out that there were people doing things like this, trying to map people's profiles, doing it maybe in a more aggressive manner, maybe marketing it in a slightly shadier way. I think ethics in this regard, in this particular case, especially in open source intelligence is difficult. I think I saw a tweet very recently by a security researcher joking about how they did an open source intelligence piece of research on a day and uh, on a person. And, you know, I think it's kind of difficult to say, you know, you're wrong in that, but it's also, I find it uncomfortable to completely, you know, find that really comfortable to do so i think i'm i don't know i'm middle of the road on that neutral but it's kind of difficult to sort of tell someone off you know it's i get that people are excited in this subject and you know you shouldn't necessarily have to we, we have to develop a framework but 
there's there's levels of interest and development that have to happen in this area as well to sort of understand online life and psychological online life compared to outside and in real psychological life our conversations outside i don't think we do that enough um Professor, and I hope I say this correctly, Shosana Zaboff did this fantastic book that I was able to read. Read The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. I think I've actually switched those. I can see that the references are actually switched, one and two, which is an absolutely terrible mistake by me, and I should have looked. So one and two references should be switched on the screen there. But anyway, ideas over surveillance capitalism and the behavior surplus idea and how that's being conducted in social media giants is really an interesting book in sort of what they do and actually not even social media technology giants overall and you know you could do you look at the ethics of it of course but also just the the pure idea of it is an interesting one which sort of look for me feeds off intelligence agencies which is hinted in the book, but also threat intelligence is based off military and, and government concepts. And so for me, it was kind of an interesting book to look over and, and understand this and actually see the, the variations, the, the differences and what, what's going on there. So that book really enlightened in that case. Um, APTs have been using social media for manipulation purposes, which I think I discussed slightly in the last presentation I did, but not properly. Um, but there are actually real world cases now. So Mia Ash that you uh, have used social media. LinkedIn, I think, is that one, but also Instagram is often used, Facebook, Twitter. They're all used in, in various cases. I think a Russia-based threat actor very recently has used Twitter to um, sort of bring disinformation in and try and feed it in. So, you know, governments all over the world not going to say there's only one. There's Western nations that do very similar. So it's... it's um more and more prevalent but you know i think the media definitely have this sort of heightened state when it comes down to this how beneficial is it is one of those that often isn't talked about i think with cyber threat intelligence and threat intelligence over well threat intelligence overall what is the value and what is the impact is often not discussed so with that particular case manipulation on social media how beneficial is it i think we know in social media there's definitely some behavioral impacts that happen between people especially teenagers but when it comes down to manipulation of political beliefs things like this did it actually happen with trump and brexit and things like this um and i mean I'm, maybe there is discussion over that that is valid research i haven't come over research that has really convinced me but if you have particular research to hand that can convince me please do put it in the comments down below or Talk to me via Twitter at Link Kevin, and I'm happy to listen to that. Um, and use of social media has definitely increased. Of course, there's more and more platforms, um, and there's more and more things going on. And, and you know, people that are much younger than me have become more and more um, used to this space beforehand. In my age and above, this space is sort of we we understand a time when there wasn't a strong case for social media. So. Of course, social media has increased. Whether that's beneficial or not, we'll, we'll find out, I guess. Um, so I hinted about this. So on the right, uh, on the left, rather, we've got the age of surveillance capitalism, a nice little diagram that was drawn that showed sort of the cycle that happened during the sort of trying to implement a loop in data. And actually, intelligence, that's quite often what happens. So I'm more sort of comfortable with what happens in the, the right, on the external side, but of course, in the internal side, um, sort of trying to use your service to provide internal uh, information feeding in. Well, you can do this externally through threat intelligence as well with open source intelligence where you can develop a life cycle through the direction, what you want to do, the collection, the processing, how that's going to be conducted. Then the analysis, which is obviously quite important and then the dissemination of that information and then leading back so i think i don't really really need to talk about this too much but there's there's life cycles and set structures on these information pieces which i didn't really know about when i was looking at the open source intelligent research i did before and so looking at these life cycles you can definitely create a more solid framework and i feel like without knowing i feel like apts from various intelligence agencies and as, as you can see from um technological companies there are set frameworks in how to develop these sort of um campaigns and yeah it's an interesting one that, that sort of solidifies and sort of professionalizes this sort of ideas 
Um, so with that, I think in my head, I've got three sort of components to online activity that sort of glean information about a person that can lead to sort of a various amount of results. So with social media, such a huge amount of information, but actually I sort of group that together with user generated content platforms because they're very similar in their ways. Social media, of course, is used very differently, but you could say things like IMDB or forums overall where user generated content has overall. You can get some information that is relatively broadly the same. So thoughts, feelings, personality, dislike, likes, you can read like that, those sort of ideas. Then there's other online services which are commercial or otherwise which give you things like purchase patterns or have more static decisions than maybe user generated content platforms um, and then you've got the government services which are sort of tied to actual ids and very set in their information and sort of a more serious and concrete in outside activity of the outside <coughs> realm while online services, maybe people, and I think research has commonly shown this, react in a different way online to maybe they do in outside circles. So there's definitely sort of a, a, a gap there. And I don't think you could think that government services, pe people act like they do on online services as they do on government services online. So that one, I think, is a really interesting one. Were you to compromise or have access to that information? I'm not saying do that, but that's just what the sort of what we're discussing here so looking at that i think really technologists and actually from a cyber i should say information security for me cyber is still kind of a weird terminology but from an information security slash cyber realm i think people don't look at old data enough and we're really interested as practitioners the idea of everything being new 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 so zero days new exploits overall just sort of the idea of new intelligence new threat actors new threats overall there's so much ideas of new threats that you know some of these pieces of information can be led back to previous activity which you know i think some parts of the industry do really well but not all and i think is something that is really for analysts in the threat intelligence space which is where i'm at definitely need to be you know have as a value because old data still has you know it, it should excite you to sort of go into threat intelligence archaeology and enjoy that aspect of trying to dig through this pieces of information and try and understand from the ground up what this activity really is rather than sort of doing a whack-a-mole of trying to find activity and, and working through that so i think that's my personal opinion on that i think i have gripes with just parts of the industry that decide to just constantly bring out marketed new activity but again it's very easy for me to say that as i don't have you know, huge commercial requirements to do things like that. So, yeah, I understand, you know, everyone's got different goals. Um, but overall, technologists, everyone loves new technology, new tools to play with. And really, old data is one of the most interesting things. You know, Bell and Cat, when they look at researching into various uh, individuals, they're using compromised databases or, or information that is gleaned from you know tables of information that is old and is from historical information historical information is being held quite actively by very different groups be it apts or people that are really interesting in holding certain people's information i think actually as societies all over the world i think we'll find that threats towards people that are you know important in public life through understanding them in compromised data is is going to definitely increase and is definitely a concern for me um but, you know times or historical data can be used as a baseline for attacks in various manners so you know one of the biggest important points for me is compromised data is one of the biggest threats for us when it comes down to people understanding other people it's constantly being leaked and if you've got money to store this information, you can definitely develop an understanding of millions of people, if not very specific people that you'll have interest in. So at the moment, I think the big players are intelligence agencies and social media companies. I'm not pointing and saying they're doing everything that I'm saying here. I'm just saying they understand the value of old data. 
And that really is sort of the crux of this talk is that not enough people really understand the value of old data and how what what it can bring. Um, technologists are constantly looking forward without seeing the risks in permanence of historical information, I think is the big block headline that I want to put out there. George Orwell, classic guy that knows what we're, he's talking about. <laughs> don't know why I'd say what classic guy um but no he he really understood you know information and what the value of information overall and it's I think sort of a tick box exercise or like oh yeah fantastic talk uh, talk Jack really poignant but actually conducting research into old data isn't sexy but doing it really would bring value and, and the reason I say that is there's an actually experiment I've, I've gone i've skipped a slide but i'll talk about that in a sec one of the things i think is a really good sort of user case is back in the 90s this guy on the left was uh aka wicked rose leader of a famous china uh based hacker group you can see a very old operating system and a lovely monitor there and he was well known for being a very good hacker we can see he's a college student there. And then uh, later on in 2020, the uh, and that, there's actually a fantastic paper, I should say, which I haven't linked here, which is really unfortunate from me. But there's a fantastic paper that talks about China-based threat actors and sort of just the hacker community between like <coughs> the 90s and the early 2000s and beyond and sort of just talking about the different structures and everything going on beyond there, which is a super good piece of, I think it's like 40 pages or so, a really good piece of uh, academic study that's kind of rare in the academic circles, in my opinion. Um, and then in 2020, this guy, Tan Dalian, um, is then seen in an indictment from uh, the US government, and he's part of the APT41 group, which are famously sort of a half and half or a sort of somewhat crime based activity, but also leading in state based goals activity as well. So I think it's just an interesting one that you know you can develop the permanence of someone's timeline by looking at historical information, understanding someone, and I think that's. Obviously, that's not really a, oh, wow, what a really interesting piece of information you've said there. I think, you know, detectives and classic intelligence agencies understand that. But with a sort of computer intelligence, cyber and threat intelligence sort of lens on it, you can sort of really start to see the value of sort of tracking individuals from a public space. But you, if you're interested in a really highly public profile figure, say, you know, at the moment, for example, we've got quite a lot of examples now of hacker for hire where they do phishing campaigns and target journalists or businesses and things like this based in large parts of um, areas of the world. I'm not going to define one one country, just, to, you know, there's large parts of research from Google, Facebook and others, Microsoft, that have shown hacker for hire campaigns. And, you know, I, th I think that really goes to show that actually the next stage in my head would be these hacker for hire places will be able to understand the the importance of compromised databases and it doesn't have to be from those countries i'm thinking of or of those reports that we currently have but all over the world there will be state aligned companies that will be able to use information that's historical to compromise someone's head essentially through online activity in my mind i can see you know the decisions that people make every day through online activity really gives a big picture of various parts which we're seeing in cambridge analytica and it doesn't have to be every single move but it can be a baseline of activity and an understood way that someone might behave which is ideally sort of what some people like to know is sort of what is that person's behavior going to be? What is their next direction? It, it sort of directs financial markets in some ways and it directs our lives overall. Um, so I did an experiment and I did another visualization which doesn't glean a lot of information. I have to sort of talk about it. So here we've got a very interesting piece of information. The red are the nodes and the gray are very thin thread no uh, edges. And essentially what this is showing is a large amount of compromised databases. Um, I think it was over 10,000 users. It was a very quick experiment. Um, 
and I I'm completely wanted to anonymize the compromised database data because it is kind of difficult in the ethics side to sort of do this sort of research in some way. But I think it is important for the people that don't play by the rules can get away with this. And, you know, this experiment is essentially showing um, the nodes contain individual users and websites and individual users from my research connected to multiple websites and allowed you to get a frame of their activity online. So if you hold a huge amount of compromised databases, you can then link every compromised database together and you could start to understand all of their activity depending on how much access you have to these compromised databases. So if, for example, here, this diagram is essentially showing the linkages between not there isn't just three sites here there are a load of different sites and it's showing the interconnectivity between loads of different users and loads of different sites so here we can see sort of loads of different nodes that maybe are not completely linked but actually we've got huge nests of activity i call them nests but huge swarm swarms of activity that are very interlinked and very sort of developed together and i mean this is of course a gra graphing algorithm that maybe is portraying it in a different way but when i had the raw data myself the users to multiple sites was clear it was a lot of users that were developed and maybe i should develop some statistics to maybe convince people some more that this might be a difficulty uh in the future and i think my main point i want to say is that really i think Online subconscious is maybe believe, maybe too strong, but I do think that with this sort of experimental activity, you can develop a deep understanding of someone's online subconscious in some ways because you are seeing their moves. If you've got access to all of this leaked information, you can develop a real idea. And it isn't just through corporate companies like Cambridge Analytica. There are other companies out there that are not playing by the rules, that are definitely will be using things like this to understand people of power. And that to me is a problem for people that go into your governments, wherever they are, is my definite angle, is that these people can be compromised if you don't have an understanding of that person's position. So that research into people of political power or those of high business power need to be researched on not for sort of investigatory dodgy links but for simple self-defense mechanisms towards people that might want to distort or destroy structures of other countries and really that's the talk so hopefully that was interesting enough and you you know you've got feedback so definitely Give me a reply down below if you found that interesting. If you didn't, then just don't reply and that's fine. Um, but yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it.